So we had some uh, Wi-Fi issues here, so um, sorry for the delay. Um, my name is Sohail. I'm, I'm going to talk about open flow and virtualization, just an overview. Um, uh, and uh, if, if we have time, I will show you a demo and like a brief hands-on experience of what is open flow. So traditionally, uh, networking gears uh, have the mainframe uh, business model. So you have a big box that this box has forwarding hardware. On top of that, there's operating system. There are a lot of apps. And on top of that, you have a management interface that you can connect to this switch router or any kind of networking gear. Configure that using this app to uh, uh, just get a network functionality out of the single box. So basically, these apps in the switches that can be hardware accelerated or not, or just software only, are implementing more than 5,000 RFCs, uh, which means uh, like hundreds of protocols and tens of protocol families, which in an enterprise, you will use just a handful of them. But these switches, because they have to sell it off the shelf, you, you, you buy it and you can use different features, different protocols. Um, the network gear provider has to implement these, like routing, access control protocols, and many other transport protocols and uh, security things like IGP, BGP routing protocols, and lots of them. So these buses are actually uh, becoming the SUVs of networks. So they are, if you will, they are low tech. Um, as you can see in this figure, there's a software here that is cost, uh, customized for this hardware. So basically, we have very strongly coupled hardware and software. And uh, packets are mostly processed here. But this hardware is controlled by these applications here. So we have data and control things strongly coupled as well. And there's no open API, actually. Uh, before OpenFlow. So when OpenFlow emerged, um, network providers started to uh, uh, provide APIs and SDK. So we are living in a better world now, but it's kind of too late because OpenFlow is targeting this open API, lack of open API. So that three major problem um, result into complex, rigid, and expensive boxes. So this box, have, uh, if you want to buy it, you have to pay for all the apps that they are available and all the hardware that you might not use. And because you don't have open API, you have to pay operational costs, which are high. So basically, if you uh, watch the talks of networking people, like uh, James Hamilton from Amazon, uh, which is a senior staff there, uh, the argument is essentially network is always in your way. Because these boxes here are really bloated, they are hard to manage, and they are the SUVs. So uh, when uh, you uh, when uh, dialing the cloud and visualization emerge, instead of just one end host in the data center, you have several VMs. Like on Hadi's laptop, you've seen two VMs. Like you, he keep quick post more than that. And these VMs, each of them, like my VMs, would be hosted with yours. And they have to provide isolation, cost, uh, QoS, SLA, lots of um, other security stuff, uh, just to uh, provide an illusion that these two VMs are running on a LAN. And it is really hard because uh, networking gears do not provide good management APIs. So the community is started to ask for open APIs for the switches. So there's a single API that you can use for configuring the switch. In the research community, uh, network operators and network programs all need an open API. So in the research community, they started to develop that API. And there's actually a 
background for that, like it has been started in 90s. But OpenFlow has started in 2006, so there, there's a history there. But the, 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 they, are, they were all aiming at providing an API. So the first question is here, when you want to create an API is, what are the functionalities, right? So what are the functionalities that you want to expose <coughs> outside that box? So basically, we are looking for network primitives, right? So what are the network primitives? There are things that are done in data plane. Everything that is done in like hardware in the silicon chip that you can buy at the show is uh, providing that those primitives, right? So like uh, forwarding a packet from one port of a switch to another port, writing the header of the packet, implementing TTL, something like that, attaching, uh, adding a VLAN tag to a packet. These are all primitives of network that are provided, uh, you know, they can be easily provided in hardware. So they assume that data plane functionalities, these simple functions, uh, are the primitives, and then they, based on that, that primitives that are inside of a forwarding layer, they provide an API, which is called OpenFlow API. And that's basically exposing the primitives supported, like in hardware, and then you can access it in, in software and configure the box. Configure this forwarding for data. Thank you. Does that make sense? So it's, it's really simple. But the problem is we have many uh, traditional network boxes in our network, and it's really hard to uh, make them open flow enabled and then build the central, uh, build a software that controls that switch. So an open flow network usually consists of networking gears that are open flow enabled, and that software is called the network controller that provides an abstraction of the network this is like a middleware, like say Apache server for your apps for networking apps that provide these APIs. That I will show a demo of that those apps, a simple demo. But basic, the basic thing is there is a TCP connection here, and then controller talks to the switch, and your app using the, uh, the network controller can configure the network. Comparing this to traditional network gear, um, anything beyond the operating system of the networking gear is actually moved to the software. So these two are decoupled in open flow network. So you have a software controlling those boxes, and you have hardware and OSIS running on these uh, networking gears that are just doing uh, forwarding and data plane uh, uh, that are performing those data plane and forwarding functions. In the literature, this portion of the network is called data plane, and anything beyond the controller is called control, the RAS and the controllers. And that's why the, the, uh, the argument behind OpenFlow is decoupling data plane from control plane. So in traditional network gear, you have control plane, data plane, and single box, and now you have to couple them. Your box is one, and they're uh, centrally controlled. Just in brief, I will get into details of each of these items, but what OpenFlow provides is, is a handshaking. An OpenFlow switch can uh, handshake with a controller, like, hello, I'm a switch, I have these features, I have these many ports. And uh, controller also can uh, do some handshaking stuff. You can check the status of the ports and the switch, uh, and uh, like uh, collecting the stats, and also, you can uh, install forwarding rules. And what is a uh, flow entry rule? These are flow entry. So um, that one is the input port, the, this column. This is a source MAC address, destination MAC address, source IP, destination IP, TCP source port, TCP destination port. And this is the action you want to apply. So these are the flow entry rules, and these are the 
main part of OpenFlow. So what the first rule says, it's uh, any packet coming from switch port number one forwarded to port number two. And any packet that is, uh, that the destination port is 4444, drop it. Or any packet uh, is coming from port one with this white card is MAC, MAC address and with this IP prefix forwarded to port number three. That is this simple. So OpenFlow gives you the API to install these kind of rules on the switch. So, but there is a problem in this flow interest rate. And what's the problem? There's a conflict between these two. So it's not that simple. So when you're installing rules, you have to take it up on clicks and okay, when a packet comes and any packet that matches this uh, row will match that row as well. So what I can do with this? So there are many details in, uh, inside the OpenFlow's protocol and specification, which are beyond the, this presentation, but uh, it is not that, that easy to configure the network. So you have to uh, take care of these um, complexities in software. So OpenFlow is, uh, uh, is uh, a boss in network virtualization domain. So network virtualization is always referred to as a key there for OpenFlow. So it's the best fit for OpenFlow. Why? Because in that network that I've shown you that we have several virtual machines, we need a programmable control interface for the switches. We uh, require uh, easier management that OpenFlow provides for us. You can automatically configure it in, in software. And it is vendor agnostic, so Amazon can buy it by OpenFlow switches that are conformant to, to that standard and use it out of the box in the network using the software that was controlling another switch but using the OpenFlow API. And that is important for uh, warehouse scale data centers. So let me give you an example of network virtualization and OpenFlow. Suppose that we have this simple network, and we have OpenStack, our cloud controller, like Nova and OpenStack over there. We have an OpenFlow controller that controls our switches, and we have two OpenFlow switch, OpenFlow enabled switch. And uh, your machines are connected to those switches, and that OpenFlow controller controls that switch. Let's say we have the blue tent, our blue user. The first request is create a VM for me. So create VM goes to this cloud, cloud controller, and this cloud controller first boots the VM using any technology they're using. So there's a VM booted here. Then it tells the OpenFlow controller that my VM is hosted on Hadi's laptop. There's an interface attached to it and attach this VM to user B's network. Okay. So OpenFlow controllers know there's a VM on one of the machines connected to switch one, and it knows this link is connected to port one of this switch. Okay. So it tells the switch to tag any packet coming from this port with blue, color that with blue. It can be implemented at VLAN or MPLS or anything. So that switch, after OpenFlow tells the switch, has a forwarding rule that if the port is number one, color the packet as blue. Let's say another uh, request comes from that user, putting VM2, the same uh, process happens and another rule installs it. So any packet coming from port one is marked as blue, and uh, from port two is marked as blue, and from port one marked as blue. Let's say another user requests his first VM in the purple network. What happens here is 
adding another rule to that switch, right? Anything coming from port 3, color it with purple. Then another VM, it requests another VM, and that VM, because uh, it was connected to the switch of full, we have to put it on another switch. And the open flow controller tells the switch 2 that package it, each packet coming from port 1 with purple. So what it does is installing another rule. So right now our network has the state of four rules on two switches. If you have, if you want wanted to do this with traditional network, you have to create uh, this whole open flow thing on your own, like using their command line interface or uh, buying some SDK from them to do this. But open flow provides an open API that you can do this with any open flow switch. That one can come from Cisco, the other one can come from Juniper if they support open flow. So let's say uh, this user starts to ping VM2 from its, its VM1. What happens is a packet is generated on the interface of this VM, right? So it goes to the first switch. It's marked as purple because there is a rule here that says if the packet comes from port 3, just call it as purple, and it forwards it to another switch. And what happens here? What, what did we do here? We matched this packet with these three rules. So that packet was coming from port 3, so we matched this rule and we applied this action. Right? So what should happen here? We should go over the rules. right? So there is a rule called uh, that rule, the first rule from uh, if, if a packet comes from port number 1, color it purple. It, does this packet come from port 1? So what happens? You can drop it, or by default, the switch forwards this packet to the control. Okay. So when there's no match, you can configure this, either uh, drop it or send it to the control. But by default, it's sent to the controller. The controller then decides that, okay, this packet is purple. Probably it should be forwarded to port uh, 1, which is uh, uh, for the connected to VM2. So it installs another rule on the switch, which is if the packet is purple, send it on port number one. So in, in this that example, we have two types of rule installation. We have proactively installed four rules when the VMs were booting up, and we have reactively react as a reaction to a packet a new packet, if it doesn't match any rule, we install another rule on that switch. So in OpenFlow networks, when you want to install, when you want to design networks, there are two approaches. You can install all the rules reactively or proactively, or a hybrid, which uh, I've done here. What is the problem with reactive? It's actually make your, will make your network store because every packet has to go to the controller they have to do some computation install rules. So there's at least a flow initiation delay. But if you install all the packets, all the rules proactively, your network uh, won't have any flow initiation delay, but you can't have a dynamic network that based on the load and number of the packets installing new rules, right? So you have to monitor. It's, it's, it's basically a trade-off between programmability and performance. And this is basically what is done in, op in OpenStack with OpenFlow today. So they have this quantum here that tells the OpenFlow controller that I have these switches and this VM is connected to this switch. It's booted off, connect this interface to the switch. And we have blue networks and purple networks. So they have IDs for the network. And instead of colleges, have numbers. So this is uh, roughly what is happening today. Um, and this process that we were talking about is, was, is called network embedding. So the network embedding problem, which is the uh, theoretical aspect of network virtualization, 
you have a request for virtual networks, like user blue has requested two VMs that are connected, or purple two VMs that are connected. And then you want the cloud computing infrastructure to map it to, to its physical network. So this is what is done using OpenFlow and OpenStack. There's a question. Sure. How does OpenFlow differentiate between users? In, uh, in this example, for example. So OpenFlow does not know uh, the, the user. It just, uh, when, the, when the cloud controller adds a user, for each user we have, say, a network with a unique ID. Each user can have multiple networks in OpenStack, for example. But let's say I have network one and you have network two. So um, for each VM that is booted up uh, for network one, there's a driver here that boots up your virtual interface. And that virtual interface is part of, in OpenStack is part of Nova, for, for example. It's mostly part of uh, the virtualization library you use. After you initiate that interface, um, uh, this um, uh, Nova network manager um, tells the OpenFlow controller that we have a network and the interface is ready. So what it does is uh, assigning a rule that push a VLAN tag on that interface for any outcoming path. Um, in, in one implementation. In, in another, you can use MTLS. There is actually some implementations that don't use any tag. So basically, because you, you have in uh, open stack lock environments that you, you have control over the MAC addresses of these interfaces, you can assign any, any MAC address you want, right? So and if that MAC address is unique in your network, you can use it as um, for forwarding for groups on the first switch. And then, but, but you have to keep that MAC address on the packet when it arrives at the destination. So um, a hard, harder version of that embedding problem is when the user requests an, a virtual switch. So I, in Solly, for example, you will have a network experimenter, that, just a researcher, that wants a network, a, a networking experiment running on Solly. That network experiment has an open flow switch between two VMs. So in this case, it is actually much harder than what we have seen in previous example, that you have to boot these VMs and then just install rules. You have to provide a virtual switch, and that virtual switch provides a connectivity. So it looks really complex, but with OpenFlow, it's actually easy to realize and embed this virtual network. So let's say, we have this green network here. You boot up the VM on this end host, VM2 on this end host, and you want to allocate this virtual switch on this physical switch. So there was a, a virtual host on a physical host, there's a virtual switch on a physical switch. But how does it happen? So any rule that this controller of the researcher is going to install on its uh, Visual switch, you are going to end it with tag green. So it can just affect packets that are labeled as green. So any packet that is inside network green, uh, they will go through the rules installed with that control. Okay. And any packet that is green and is not matched to any rule in this switch is forwarded to that control. So basically, this controller sees this to, uh, can connect to this switch, but only for the green network. So it has a slice of the network. You tag each packet on these interfaces, and in between in the network, you can just use that tag for virtualization. Does that make sense? So it's basically a very simple uh, slicing based on labels. Rules are, and uh, just and the uh, green and all or mash green packets are sent to this control.
So this, this was just an overview, so a little bit more details on OpenFlow. So how they actually implement OpenFlow in switches? Because there is no market just for OpenFlow on these switches, for now, they have to compile OpenFlow agents on their switches that SUV just has an API, uh, an agent that providing that API. So basically, today OpenFlow switches are not OpenFlow only. They are hybrid. They are traditional switches that have OpenFlow here. So the first goal is not achieved yet. So the switches are not cheap. They are still expensive. They are global. And because this OpenFlow agent is running on their operating system, there are many things, there are many complexities here, like how they reply to the rules. If you install a rule on a switch, you can't be sure that that, flow, that rule is actually harder. It might take four seconds for that operating system to install, depending on the switch. And there are switches that will take, uh, in, uh, that will apply a rule in microseconds. So you have different switches because of the complexities of the traditional box. They can't provide a, an item as the open flow agent on the switch. So today it's not as good as I presented in previous example. There is, an, there is a software switch called OpenV switch. It, it is uh, first started by uh, people working on OpenFlow. And it's software stream in Linux 3.3, so it's available. The kernel module is there. And all the switches uh, that are, most of the switches that are OpenFlow enabled off the shelf are actually using Open, OpenV switch and it's uh, just compiled on their own switches. So, it's very portable to hardware, and like what Pronto does is just compiling that OBS on their, on their switch. That is the OpenFlow agent on this slide. So another uh, problem that you haven't, you've not asked is uh, how do we configure that OpenFlow switch and tell us where is the controller to connect to? So there's a chicken and egg problem, right? You have the switch, but if you connect it to the network, how does it find the controller? Or how the controller can register itself inside the switch? So after a while, just this year, there is an open, open flow config standard that is released for solving that problem. Previously, you had to connect to that switch using CLI and configure it when you buy it and connect it to the network, tell where is the controller, and uh, that was the one, the one time configuration on all open close switches. So it, it was it's not that simple to deploy open close switches. You have to configure them to uh, for for where is the open flow controller, what is the IP, and what is the flow. In open flow config, there is a controller assignment, so so you can cluster your controllers, uh, which is really good. So you can fade over that if, the, if this controller crashes, connect to this controller instead. And you can also configure ports like uh, uh, up and, a port up and down uh, using the OpenFlow config. So what are the cons of OpenFlow? First of all, there is a scalability issue. You, are, you have a fully distributed system. Each box you're operating on its own. Well, you have to configure that, but let's say they're fully distributed. And uh, we are moving all the brain in these switches to central location. So we are actually centralizing that. So there is a scalability problem here. So uh, for, to solve that problem, there are lots of distributed control things, like on its hyperflow, give off flow, and can do, which is my research. And these controllers are really fast. So for example, can do can handle 1.4 million uh, packets on a commodity is on server on a single core with a single thread. So uh, they are actually scalable, but we have to admit that there are uh, there are scalability problems in OpenFlow. In OpenFlow 1.2, they have master slave controller using that OpenFlow config that I was talking about. And then when you're going with reactive model, you have uh, scalability problems. But then you go with proactive model. Uh, because you install the rules proactively, 
there is not much communication between the switch and the controller. So you just use that API to configure the switch, you, put the you push the configuration, and that's it. So there's not much scalability problem when you use proactive model. And in industry, all the deployments are using proactive model. So there's no reactive deployment uh, to the best of my knowledge. Very good. So in terms of scalability, you still have your controller has to have a network view, right? Of the entire topology of your network right. and all the flows. Would that not be a scalability issue? Well, for the proactive model? Yeah, even for proactive. Um, the, the topology is just for when the switch comes off, it's the handshake, right? And for, for topology discovery, they're using LLDP protocol. So uh, there's, it's actually less than what is done on today network. So to, in today network, if you want to discover the topology, you have to run discover, discovery mechanism on each of the switches. So you have n square messages. But in OpenFlow, you have two one because each switch only talks to the controller. Yeah, but still, uh, I think uh, you're mainly considering like a LAN environment, but oh, yes. if it goes to LAN, so, multiple uh, LAN? OpenFlow is suited for data centers and LAN. It's not su well suited for internet scale networks. It is basically like for Sabi, you have nodes. Those nodes are OpenFlow enabled. And in, within the nodes, you have macro OpenFlow management, right? Because there are not much switches involved. But when you talk about the whole internet, you can't have a single open flow controller that controls the whole like big network. Sure, there is no like abstract no concept of uh, abstraction of a of a land that like, hundreds of switches see that as one unit or somehow to be able to manage this case. Well in Onyx, uh, they, they provide an abstraction that you can say, okay, I have a complex complicated factory topology and just give me a mesh of this network. So they provide an abstraction on top of that. But uh, on it. Yeah, what's the name of that abstraction? Um, it is called Network Interface, in, uh, interface Information Base, like Wrapped Information Base and Network. It's neat. So, um, but that is actually uh, more scalable than other no abstraction controllers because you can have hierarchies of, uh, of abstractions. So you, you, you create a network compressed in like one object on a controller, and there's a controller on top that just controls, all, it has a very general overall view of this network. So there's no detailed information about what is the flows of managed in the uh, lower layer. Yeah, but you still have, might have flows between networks, between abstractions. Yes. Uh, which you still need a unique tag. Um, in uh, unique tag problem in a data center? Mm -hmm. Or if you deploy one virtual machine in Asia, one in North America, you have different, different networks, right? If you don't have control over the connection, interconnection between these two networks, like if you don't have a VPN, a tunnel, or something that your tag does not draw, there's actually much of practical problems there. That you have to send this packet. Yeah. And, uh, but um, if, if you have control over that, that you can have an abstract tunnel which represents a virtual link between two networks, there is not uh, no scalability problem. Probably there are performance problems, but... Uh, but probably there are two controllers involved. There's actually a hierarchy of controllers. So in Onyx, Hyperflow, Devoflow, and can do. there's a hierarchy of controllers. So for example, in CanDo, we have two layers of control. One of them does this simple task that are previously done on the switch directly. The, the application that doesn't need to know the whole network, doesn't need to have the whole network view. And you handle frequent events here. So if you want to have like a hub application, a learning switch app, you run it here. Because that learning switch app doesn't need to know anything about these switches. And then any rail Events like a switch join, a port is down, a port is off, goes to the higher controller that needs to have the network wide view for routing protocols and stuff. So basically, without a hierarchical notion of without a hierarchical scheme, um, you can't deploy it in a van. But if you have a hierarchical um, 
set of controllers, you can deploy them back. That's actually what Google is doing. So this can do is one of the distributed controllers that um, will actually uh, make your network orders of magnitude more scalable. So it doesn't let uh, the frequent networking events like a packet comes or statistic collections go up to the root controller. So we, you will have for each, uh, for, a, for a handful of switches, you will have a local controller that is fast and just do very simple stuff. And just ray events are propagated to the highway. So you can scale this way. So um, there's an efficiency problem that we have low set of latency if you go with reactive model. And that latency can be really high. I will show you in a demo. It can be two orders of magnitude higher than a normal set. And the other problem, which is much important that scalability but it's not, pro, uh, it's not really, uh, for now, it's not the focus of uh, controller uh, vendors, is consistency. The problem is you have a network at time t, and at time t prime, there's another network like a switch has gone down. So you have to reconfigure the switches. And then when you want to install version two of your rules, the, the, the second configuration, there was, if there was a packet on the fly matching those old rules, and then you install a new rule, and that packet that was actually supposed to be forwarded using old rules, in the middle of it, if they started to getting influenced by the new flow. So there is a consistency problem. It might be even a route loop there. That it's actually after the uh, real or deployment, the scalability is not that much of concern now. Consistency is the real problem there. When you have everything centralized, and uh, you have to take care of versioning of the rule. So this is um, like. Uh, for Google, they had they could scale for G scale, but they had they, they had to care, take care of consistency issues. If there there is a talk in Open uh, Network uh, Summit this uh, just a few months ago, and this is like the focus of most of the talks. There. So there are many open source projects about OpenFlow. There are lots of controllers. Knox is one of the oldest ones. It was C++ and Python. The new version is just C++. They dropped the Python version. And they created a Python-only version of it called Fox that I will demo with it today. And there's a beacon, which is Java. Floodlight is a, is a commercial open, is a, com, is a production-ready open flow controller built on top of beacon. Frema is from NEC. Helios is from NEC. They're the Ruby and C. Ryu is from NTT. Masaro is from a university, and this is from our group that supports uh, those languages. So there are lots of controllers. Whatever language you like, you can use it, any of them. There are special purpose controllers. The most important one, the, the most popular one, is called Flowizer. What Flowizer does is the multicasting between switches and the controllers. So you install a rule, let's say, any packet from switch one, just send it to switch uh, to controller one. But any packet from uh, switch M, send send it to all the controllers. Or you can have uh, dif different multicasting uh, rules here, that multiplexing rules. So what it does is actually this controller will, will always see the packets, open flow packets uh, that match those rules on the flow bus. So you can split your network using. Uh, the flow by the kind of virtualized method. A SNAC is a knock space controller that is used in production. What it does is just giving you an interface for installing all the rules pro proactively. And there's a Rathful project from the Quagga guys. There are many wrapping protocols, BGP, ISIS, and so on. And there are wrapping engines for that. So they emulate uh, the network on top of all the flow. 
and those routes, you can run those routing engine on, uh, on top of OpenCore. So they have ported Quava and they're working on other routing engines. There, are, there is an OpenFlow visualization pro uh, project that you can visualize in network. There, is, there are two testing tools and there is the abstraction on top of uh, NOT which make it easier for you to program the network. And virtualization softwares, uh, most of them are, you, or the open source one, most of them are using OpenFlow or OpenV switch. OpenStack has the quantum project which has OpenFlow integration. CloudStack and Eucalyptus both have OBS and OpenFlow support. So, <coughs> just a bit of history that what is the state today and how we get to here. In 2006, this project is initiated. Um, in 2008 and 9, they started to promote the project, provide a well-defined abstraction and the protocol specification, and they released version 1 in 2009. So it took three years from being a research project to kind of production ready the specification. In 2011, after two years, they uh, released the other uh, one increment of the standard. Uh, that standard, the most important ones are supporting VLAN and MPLS. Uh, actually, better support for them. And I haven't talked about open flow tables, but using this model, these open flow tables, you can pipeline your rules. So, um, uh, I think I won't have the time to discuss this, but the goal will um, make it easier for you to program the network. And they have groups, so you can have a name group like purple and give some, just uh, attach some rules to that group, and any packet matches that group will be applied, those actions will apply in that packet. So you look at like uh, just having a single Uh, 
one megabyte of uh, packet sent. And there are auxiliary connections. Um, the, the other problem of efficiency is actually the TCP problem between the TCP connection between the switches and the controller. So TCP has its own uh, congestion control. It has in cast problems in a network. And if you want to send a lot of packets on TCP, that probably won't work. So they uh, added auxiliary connections that are UDP-based connections. So you can send uh, your frequent events on UDP and send just the most important one on TCP. But the problem is just the version 1 is implemented in switches today. And after 1.1, this implementation process actually stopped. So there's not much support for 1.2, absolutely no support for 1.3. And 1.1 is just implemented partially in OpenV switch, and no controller supports that. So you basically can't use it in any open one. So I think I have time for the demo.